Hi, I'm Andre the Beast Creighton, and welcome to another exciting show with Andre the Beast. You know, today we have another exciting guest. You've recognized him on Fox 59. He's in every restaurant. He's in every business. Uh, he is all over the state <laughs> of Indiana. we like to welcome a good friend of mine. Where is Sherman Burnett? Well, he's not at the McDonald's. <laughs> He is actually <laughs> on the Andre McDonald's, the Beast show. Really? <laughs> well, <bring> that up. <laughs> Welcome, It's Sherman. not like we met there or anything. I don't know what you mean. But anyway, good morning, man. Good morning. Remember, how how you are you doing? Yes. I'm doing great. <laughs> so, you know, mm-hmm. you have been everywhere. You've seen everything <laughs> well, in Indiana. Um, tell the viewers about Sherman real quick. Well, so I'm from Indy, my hometown, Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, born and raised. Established in 1960. Okay. <laughs> what does that make me? Um, and 1963 I, uh, here. <laughs> I know, I know. I saw that, so I had to copy. Anyway, um, from, born and raised, IPS, school number 43, Broderpool High School, Ball okay. State University, uh, TCOM major, for those who know what that is, telecommunications, broadcast journalism. I have been uh, in TV for 30-something years. Right. And uh, along with that, I've had a career background in um, acting and commercial work and modeling back in the day. Um, And so here I am. I've been around, gosh, I've lived in seven different states, worked in seven different TV markets. And speak seven different languages. Well, yes, (laughs) seven different regional dialects. Um, And (laughs) that is so true. Uh, and uh, came back home here okay. to Indy in about, oh, gosh, it was 2009 when I came back and started working for uh, Fox 59 on the morning show. Where is Sherman? Fox 59 morning news, 7.50, 8.50, and 9.50 a.m. Follow me at you know Instagram. I was to say all that anyway. You can say anything you want to say. <laughs> I just go there. It was fun. You were letting me go. So yeah, I I'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind you going. So we, we, we don't – Pre pre record or pre rehearse, mm-hmm. but we talked on the phone and and, yeah. and you shared a lot of uh, um, information with me that I, that was heartfelt and I traveled down your journey through your story. This the the the, the name of the show is is staying in that beast frame of mind, and a lot of times, Sherman, we get out of that frame of mind. Yeah. Um, people see you on TV as a role model and a lot of times when you're perceived as a role model as a superman uh uh individual you don't really want to um let people know what you go through every day because you might feel like you let them down and and so forth um you share with me some of the things Mm -hmm. that personally that you went through and the show isn't about putting people on front street by Mm -hmm. any means i don't want people to to think that but the 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 the, the show is really about having a common denominator right i may have walked in your shoes Mm -hmm. uh or how did you recover from 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 that let's take the people down a little journey yeah down the journey uh, well, first of all, definitely uh, not Superman. <laughs> uh, so living up to those expectations or when people put you on a pedestal, right? Um, yeah, I've never, I've, I've never won. I've never been one to, um, I don't know, land on that pedestal, if you will. So, I guess that's part of my upbringing uh, to be humble. That's number one. Right. Uh, so, but yes, people do, and so with that comes a variety of things, but. For me, my journey is a crazy one. Uh, I'll just start briefly. Growing up in Indy, uh, I grew up in a divorced family. My mom and dad um, were divorced. Actually, actually, I, well, I'll say it this way. They were, they were divorced before I was born. Okay. Okay. Remarried and then had me. Isn't it crazy? Anyway. Well, they must have found a common <laughs> and then, ground and to get back did, together. They did divorce again. But anyway, I'm only saying that in that my brother and I, I have a brother named Herman. Okay. Um, we grew up with our grandparents right. and uh, my dad's mother um, and um, her husband, who was really the only father figure that I had in my life. My, my father was alcoholic. Um, you know, we talked about this before, but um, right. 
alcoholism, you know, really, uh, especially uh, during the you know, 30s and 40s and 50s, it was just crazy rampant throughout the black male community. My my father was one of those um, at the time, not having any knowledge of that and being a kid. You know, to me, he was just a guy who was never there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that growing up. Um, but thanks to my father figure and my Eugene Malone was his name. Uh, we all called him Poppy. Right. Thanks to Poppy and my grandmother, who we actually called Aunt Mary. Right. We, because my grandmother had a little daycare. Everybody called her Aunt Mary. So my brother and I even growing up called our grandmother Aunt, Aunt Mary. Mary. So it was just this community. Uh, always had a lot of people around. Right. Um, a lot of kids in the house, a lot of older kids. I was always pretty much the youngest of all of the people around me. Um, so it was a diverse background. And it was a foundation that um, through that being that divorced kid, I think my grandparents were always super sensitive to that, very protective, and really tried to raise a you know a a good person, right? And someone who to instill you know, hey, you can do whatever you want to do, but here's the thing, whatever you want to do, you have to be two hundred percent better than the other person, right. and particularly because you're growing up black American, it's right. like you gotta you if if you want to be in TV, you gotta be two hundred times better than the other guy right. or gal. Right. Um, so I grew up with that kind of instinct that I really, really had to focus and be really, really good at what I do. And hopefully I do that, <laughs> I hope. But that was kind of the, the foundation. And have not having a, a father around, or actually I never met either one of my real grandfathers either, right. um, I sort of led some strange issues for me. You know, I, there's some trusting issues, there are abandonment issues that I've had. And those are things that I, gosh, man, did I have to really walk down that journey when you talk about exposing what some of the internal things that you go through. What um, age were you when, when your father actually, because you said he, that they remarried mm-hmm. and then you was conceived. So when did, when did the transformation of your father actually They remarried. And then let, yeah. So I was two, two years old when they finally had their, their last you know, split. Did you ever see your father do? Oh yeah, up? I would see him from time to time. We'd see him, but he was he was always drunk. I mean, ninety percent of the time when we saw him, he was drunk, and not typically in a mean way, but more of a jovial, hey, you know. And you could smell it, and it was just the kind of what you what you would see. And I went through disappointments of dad saying, "Hey, I'm going to come pick you up and go somewhere," and then he never show up. Um. But the main, one of the real things that happened uh, that was really broken for me is struggling, um, you know, being uh, a gay, a young gay person, I'll put it that way. Not, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people think, well, you know, when did you know, quote, that you were gay? I don't think I ever knew any other way. Right. Uh, but I just didn't know what that was. It's not like you sit down and have a conversation. Hey, by the way, you're this or you're this. And there's no label really attached to that. And generally no conversation, especially during that time. But the the one the one thing that really damaged my father's and my my relationship with my father was when I was about 16 years old. Um, there was this huge argument in the house. He had come over to visit uh, his mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, Poppy, and I came upstairs. He didn't like how I was dressed. He thought I looked like a girl and made a, you know called me those things that you uh, people be attach to yeah. you know being gay and and. It became this huge argument. Uh, it got so loud. My my grandfather, Poppy, came upstairs and broke it up and kicked my dad out of the house. And there's all kinds of things in between that, obviously. But the main thing that I took from the conversation that he had, he's like, Sherman, you have to be who you are. This Don't, was your dad that said that? My grandfather. Your grandfather. Poppy. Okay. Said he took kicked my dad out of the house and said, you have to be who you are. Just be who you are. And this was, I was 16 at the time, so we're talking about 1976 or 75. Right. I was 15 or 16 years old. Um, I never at that moment thought those words, those four, be who you are, would stay with me, those four words, be who you are. But, man, as I've gotten older, I always go back to be who you are. So I took that and, you know, I went to college and got on my own journey and, I don't know. I mean, did 
did any part of your father outside of alcoholism affect you as you got older, Mm -hmm. you know, coming, uh, acknowledging your sexuality, uh, dealing with the fact that your father uh, had an alcohol problem? Because clearly at that age, you couldn't recognize it as as an illness. Right. Well, how did you really transform it? Because you're looking for a role model at the same time and still trying to deal with mm -hmm. a newfound. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't think you, at that time you really understand or realize that you're looking for a role model, as you put it. I don't really think I've ever put that into place. But no, in terms of looking at alcoholism um, now, as we did then, mm-hmm. it really wasn't about a disease. There was never a conversation that you know that your dad had a, a disease or anyone who drank. You know, it was just seen as a bad thing. It was seen right. as something that you, this person, is not living up to their responsibilities. Um, and everything, with that said, everything that my grandfather, Poppy, who again was not my blood grandfather, but raised me and my brother, um, as my grandmother's second, third husband, or something like that, but um, he instilled in us something that. Look, whatever you do, don't be your father. Right. Right? Now, that was done purposely to not, you know, to try to say don't go down the road that your dad did. So there was never a discussion about, well, you know, he's got an illness or – and again, that was – you know, we never looked at alcoholism to my knowledge at that time as anything that was an addiction which translated into an illness. It was a – social problem that a person would bring upon him or herself his or herself and that's the way i was raised around it how did it affect you and your brother because evidently Mm -hmm. you and your brother had to be tight we were initially my brother there's a five-year difference between us so there's a there's a you know there's a generation doesn't sound like a lot when you say it now but you know when you're 10 and your brother's 15 you know there you know there's a big difference actually it's like a four and a half your difference between us, but it's you know translates into five years. And my brother was born at a uh, early, so he graduated from high school. I think when he was like sixteen or seventeen, just because of when he was born mm-hmm. in October. So he went to school. He was always like a year ahead, mm-hmm. age wise, of his group, which made him a year ahead of me even more <laughs> in high school. Or we were never in uh, high school together or anything like that. So we never shared that those experiences together. We were close when we were little. But as he became a teenager and do the things that teenagers do, and my brother's like, yeah, he's a little kid to me. So we didn't, we weren't. But initially, yes, we were close. And because of that whole broken uh, scenario uh, with our 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 nucleus, our family, with our mom and our dad, and um, but you know, for me, it translated into listening to what poppy would say to me is like you gotta do better you gotta you know you gotta find you, you you gotta come up with something that you're passionate about follow what it is be who you are with it and go for it and do whatever that is but you have to be dedicated to it and as long as you're dedicated to it you go to school you get you get good grades you focus um, and what he said to me is like whatever you don't have in a scholarship or a grant i will pay right so my grandfather, and he did, he paid for me to go, whatever I didn't get in any kind of financial assistance, my grandfather paid total at Ball State. I didn't graduate with any student debt or anything. So what a gift, right? Was there ever any parts of going, growing up before the, while going to college and, mm-hmm. and school that there was any form of that for yourself that you just felt, what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, looking for that ear to to, mm-hmm. to 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 hear your pain because you're young and you 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 all the stuff is falling up on your plate and the people that you depend on mm-hmm. the most wasn't there and that's well you know I guess more over I guess I should emphasize that I always felt loved I never felt like I was un unloved and I don't think my brother did either um, but it's um, it, it was instilled in us that what we determine or what we need what we determine or help determine our own destiny Mm -hmm. you have to put in the work to get to get result Mm -hmm. Um, so 
it was never raised. We were never raised to have like a pity party, if you will. I don't really know if that's the correct way to say it. So that for me made me really not look at whatever issues there really were around it. You know, I never really, you know, I can say what I, you know, the experience I had growing up and we all have whatever. Um, But I don't think I, even though I lived it externally, I don't think I lived it internally. And so I always credit my my grandfather or Poppy for being a huge influence on that because he he was the one who's just like you you know all these forces and influences that are around you uh, first of all be who you are and second don't let a situation control you you control it mm-hmm. and by that um, those two foundations for me really just once I really figured out. Yeah, I can do something for myself, for my life. I can have a goal and go there and achieve it. Once I really gravitated toward that, I just kind of, I kind of went there without really thinking, if that makes sense. It was just, that's what I should do. Were there ever moments in your life that um, the struggles Mm -hmm. manifested? moving forward with your life oh because times have changed oh absolutely you know so mm-hmm. what were those i mean things gosh so many andre i mean um as i mentioned um i moved around the country a lot and um uh, the saying goes you know wherever you wherever you go there you are right right um and it was as I was moving around the country and getting older and going to different and living in different places where those things started, you know, coming to it started to manifest in different ways. Yes, um, like what? I think abandonment was one of the huge I was issues say that. that for me. And I think I found myself putting myself in relationships that I probably knew. Well, now looking back, I knew they wouldn't work. And I think subconsciously. You know, I was putting myself in a situation with a person that, you know, I knew it wasn't going to work, but for whatever reason, I entertained it. Of course, it didn't last. Right. Um, but because I didn't want to feel the pain of being abandoned, it's kind of like, well, if I do it with this person, it doesn't really matter because they can move out of my life and I can move on to a different TV market and work and it's I'm not going to suffer any pain from moving on mm-hmm. or that person leaving or me leaving them. Um, I won't. I won't feel that pain, right? Did you eventually so, feel the pain subconsciously? I or, think you know. In some ways, in some ways, I did still because, um, you know, when you are in TV news, and if you're pursuing a career, is particularly on air, that means well. Back in the day, I mean, maybe even today, but more so back in the uh, '80s and '90s, um, '70s, '80s, and '90s, that you that definitely meant that you were going to move around. Right. right. So if you're going to if you want to work your way up to a network, let's say, or you wanted to work your way to back to work in Chicago or New York, um, once you graduated from college and started looking for those jobs, you, you were going to work in Paducah. Right. In Illinois, or you're going to work in St. Joseph, <laughs> Missouri, like I did. And those those tiny markets. But what happens is um, we become, you know, sort of like gypsies if you will moving around and as you move you know you gather friends and all these places that you you live in these tiny little towns and tight working these tiny news tiny newsrooms and there's a camaraderie that comes with that um so through those relationships i started to learn about myself and the weaknesses that i had um emotionally um and not just abandonment but you know um Rejection. Rejection okay. is a huge thing in TV, or if you're an actor or whatever, telling you no. Why Someone is it such like, a we huge don't thing? want you. Well, you're not good. Eh, you know, we're, we're, we like you, but we're going to hire somebody else, right? You might audition for a job, or you might, in, in our business, send in a resume tape and think, oh my gosh, I'd love to get this job in San Diego, right? I think I was going And then you don't. Right. Um, those are rejections, and you learn to deal with those. So I had to learn. A lot about myself through that and and I grew up there was a lot of growing up there was a lot of praying there was a lot of going to church there was a lot of a lot of things but looking back those were all life lessons and I think as we the building blocks of our lives um, I think if we really capture where we are today versus where we've been mm-hmm. 
um, everything sort of makes sense, right? And we have to take personal responsibility for whatever has happened or hasn't happened. Because ultimately, really, at the end of the day, right. you know, we, we have actions and um, actions have consequences. And sometimes we do things that we probably shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And there are consequences. And a lot of times we want to say, oh, my gosh, that was so-and-so's fault. Or, why, you know, he's such a this or she's such a that. When actuality, we may have brought that on ourselves. Well, correct. Right? Correct. So I had to stop blaming others and start looking internally and saying, you know what, Sherman, what was your role in whatever situation you ended up? What were some of the things that you was blaming others for that that – you felt needed to be taken accountability for for on your part uh, you know one of the things that um, one of my friends would say to me we would go in a newsroom having a newsroom meeting and morning meeting we call them and who's gonna do what who what reporter is gonna have what story for the particular day um, and one of my friends said to me Sherman's so moody <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I like, can come in one day, he's like, yeah, and come in one day, like, oh, don't talk to me. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that was one of the huge things that all of this, you know, translated into me, for me, was when I was moody, I would be, you know, happy one day, not so much the next. Some of that was insecurity. Right. Uh, and some of that, I found that later found out that I was actually um, clinically or dealing with clinical depression. We're going to get to that. Keep going. You know, but I didn't, uh, wasn't necess- it wasn't diagnosed at the time. Right. But those, I think those are, are things and life lessons and things for me in my journey that I, I feel like I, I, I love to share stories like that. And I love the fact that you asked me to come on just kind of chat because yeah. I don't, I feel like, you know, with, with work, people kind of get the uh, maybe a one-dimensional look at you, who you are, which is, you know, I get an opportunity to do some fun stuff on TV, and that's fun, and it's great, and it's a great platform, but, you know, you get stereotyped. You know, people think, oh, my gosh, you're always so happy, or you're always so this, and but there's a journey. You right. know, there's always a story behind a person, Right. and I've, I've spent a lifetime telling other people's stories. Right. Never really focusing on mine. That's what this show is about. And um, I've I've learned over the last few years that, you know what, I, I I should be okay with telling my story. Nobody can tell it better than right? you, too. And it's okay to yeah. do, and it's okay yeah. to, to to take the ups and downs and, and, and expose yourself and, you know, in terms of your emotional self um, and say, you know, this is what happened to me. And this is my, my book. Right. These are my chapters. Read it, you know. And maybe someone will take something from it. Maybe someone will extrapolate something from that that might help him or her or say, you know what? Oh, my gosh, I didn't realize. And for me, that one thing that I, um, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of doing a memoir. I hope I, I finally get it done someday. That's my, my prayer. Uh, because not just for me, but I really want to leave something that says, oh, my gosh, read this that this guy wrote 10 years ago. He's long gone, but look, right. look at whatever. Um and depression, depression is a huge part of that. And when I say that clinical, clinical depression is a huge part of my journey. Most people would have no idea that that's something that I have uh, was diagnosed. When and did you lived When with. did you recognize it that that you was that you may have been now proven that you was yeah. getting depressed? Well, I don't Were think there I, a series of events. Yeah, you know what, Andre? I don't think I ever really recognized that it was until I hit the right. bottom of the barrel and when know? was that uh that would have been i was living in upstate new york um so about two, two 2002 or something it was about 18 years ago mm-hmm. um longer the short of it was i living by myself um working an evening shift doing an evening newscast anchoring come home you know you're on the high from being on tv for an hour and you uh, anyway long story but you know i started drinking um uh, by myself and then i was working out as well and i'm like oh my gosh i, I got a pain i got this so I'm, you know popping a little ibuprofen over the counter and drinking and you know that mix together is not a good one right and the next thing you know i one day um i was actually on the phone with my mother here in Indy, and um, I was in upstate New York. 
And I, I basically started rambling and didn't make any sense. Um, I kind of blacked out. Really? Um, my mom. While your mom was on the phone talking to you? Uh, yeah. And so my mom then, at the time, I was living in this apartment building in uh, downtown uh, Rochester, New York, upstate New York. And I had a friend who lived in the same building. He had a key. He had access to get into she had his phone number and was able to finally somehow even though my i you know i never i didn't hang up on the other end because i had passed out but she was able to get to him to get to me and come to my apartment get in to see me and woke me up mm -hmm. and um the rest of that led to uh you know i, I was i i wasn't hospitalized but i was i was i made my way to a uh a doctor who then referred me to a therapist and that began my you know journey to understand uh, clinical depression and what it was and where I had had come to be and there's a lot of pain through those you know therapy sessions and you start to do this and do that and um, you yeah I, I had letter you, I had letters I had to write to people um, almost you know like a I guess uh, true confessions. A -A. Uh, yeah, true confessions, but also to say, okay, this is the pain I felt from you, and this is the pain. This is what I feel I need to say to you, which I hadn't said. And I think what a lot of people, um, once you realize a clinical depression, it can come about in many different ways. But a lot of times, it it, it does deal with suppressing your own emotions. For was the, a lot of those for, emotions from childhood? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! I, I had to write letter to my. I had to write my. Um, wrote a letter to my dad, who was deceased. Right. But, you know. I, I think we talked about yeah, that a little I wrote, bit. Yeah. I wrote a letter. Uh, I wrote a letter to my brother or my mom. Um, the you know the nucleus of my uh, family. Uh, I wrote a letter to Poppy, who was so influential in my life. More of a thank you letter to him, but all those things emotionally that I. I thought I had dealt with. We usually just put them in the closet. Yeah, but I didn't. So all these things led to this crazy uh, depression, and I started to understand some of the choices I was I had made with the people who I picked to be in my inner circle in life. Inner circle meaning I always had fantastic friends, but the people I chose to be, you know, a partner or a lover or whatever, um, were never the right ones ever. Right and. You know, I would blame them, but in actuality, it was me. You know, I was I was really the problem. So um, when you look back at the when you look back at the letters that you wrote, mm -hmm. uh, I have and, a couple and, of them. Yeah, and and you're right because uh, I I talked to my therapist uh, Steve Cooper, great therapist, and uh, a lot of our depressions, a lot of our um, traumas that mm -hmm. we deal with actually stem from our childhood. And it's funny because we don't really realize how important our childhood is in the people mm -hmm. that are involved in our development, mm -hmm. not just early development, but truly development as we manifest into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And it's funny uh, that we keep it locked up inside. Oh my gosh. You're, and I will tell you, um, you know, we you know, like I said, you and I had a conversation about me coming on and, and doing this with you, and um, I really genuinely feel that opening up and talking about, you know, what I've gone through um, is really meant for others to hear, and because there's so so much that we go through in life. There's so many different ways to place it and put it. I mean, um, you know, you, you pray over it. You pray for it. You uh, share with friends. Uh, you may have avenues to do all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, you really have to be the person to deal with it and figure out what's going on. Accountability within yourself. And in order to get help, you got to know what you need help in. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. And so once, you know, for me, once I got to that space, mm -hmm. things really did change for me. I mean, it wasn't still perfect, but 
because I still always have to do work. Right. You know, I always, I mean, even today in my relationship, I always have to go, wait a minute, that's not mine. You know, that's yours. Uh, and tying myself into someone else's issue. I think that's why a lot of relationships in breaking up because you know you, you're together and you think oh my gosh and everything that that person has and they have we all intertwine and his emotions or her emotions are mine and mine and they're not right you know they're separate and we wind up taking on things or that person might take on something of yours and you're trying to recognize that and go uh no you you do you I do me, together we do us. It's two different things than just being us, right. in my opinion. It's like, I have to be healthy for you, you have to be healthy for me. Um, I discovered in my journey that one of the issues that was really difficult for me was control. Right. Like I always felt like, I never felt like I was a person who had to be in control, or a control freak. <laughs> But I am, <laughs> you know, I really am. I mean, I can say that out loud. When did mm. you realize you was a control freak? <laughs> yeah, not early enough. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's like, you know, I mean, even in my job today, I, I, I produce, I write, I, uh, you know, I do all the planning. And so it does play to my uh, control side. Um, but I don't think I've ever, that's that's one I don't think I've conquered. I mean, I, I just don't. I have to, you know, I got to pray and step back and look at me a lot and go, uh-uh, Sherman, see, this is, what you know, that just let it, let someone right. do, right? I mean, even sitting here, you know, I said to you, I'm like, I'm not used to being, <laughs> I'm not used you know, to I'm not being, used to being the, you know, the guest. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, I'm in Andre's hands now. But I must say, I, I feel comfortable uh, with you, though. So, you but, know what? I said that you know. uh, to to uh, to Jason and I was like, you know, it's going to be a good show. And, I, and he was, you know, like, why? I said, because I can tell he feels comfortable because mm -hmm. it's difficult to talk about any type of uh, mental yeah. Issue, any type, of, especially when you're in the public's eye. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I don't know. I mean, you're right. There's that. And I I don't know. And you know, for me, I see myself as Sherman and not necessarily, a you know, a public figure. But, I mean, I recognize that it that's definitely there. Um, but, I, 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 you know, I'm happy to share, though. You know, I just think... And I genuinely think that's what at least some people, a lot of people will say to me when they see me on TV. They're like, oh, my gosh, you just seem like the same you or whatever. It's just. Right. Um, and so I don't think if someone who happens to listen to this and go, oh, I watched that guy. I don't think they would be surprised to hear that I would say any. They might be surprised to hear I might that I've lived through a depression and some other things, but not be surprised at the fact that I'm talking about it. I think a lot of case. people are afraid to talk about it. I think a lot oh my of people. You, <laughs> you know what? So funny. This is the true story. During the lockdown, mm -hmm. more people realized that they suffered from some type of depression, mm -hmm. and not just a and not just a situational. There are different types of depression, different levels. I remember uh, having to convince my mother <laughs> that I was depressed. She didn't be excuse me. She didn't believe that, and I think a lot. A lot of times, especially in the black community, uh, people, you know, black people don't get depressed. What you talking? We don't do. Oh, no, 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 no. We Believe don't do me, that. I hear that all the right? time. <laughs> we we don't go there. And so uh, that was certainly the case. My mom just did not, you know, she didn't believe that that was a thing. You know, you, or no, you're having a bad day, or you know, you're just going through a rough patch. Um, but I remember her telling me that. Um, she was in church and her pastor and my, uh, well, we grew up seventh day Adventist and, um, uh, was saying, Hey, the, the, the topic of discussion uh, led to, um, depression and the reality of it. And, um, it, uh, there's a series of Saturdays when that came up. And I remember my mom finally saying, you know, during a conversation over the phone going, you know what? I understand now. Mm -hmm. I understand. I, I genuinely, now I understand it, what you're talking about. 
And by this time, I had been maybe, I don't know, three years into therapy and medication uh, to help um, because she was totally against that. Like, you know, you just need to pray. Yeah. Right? Which you do. Right. Um, uh, but you also have to help yourself. Right. And I got help. And you got to recognize. And you got to recognize. Yeah. You know, I think I mentioned this book to you that I recently read. Uh, it's called The Mother of Black Hollywood. I already, I already ordered it. Did you order it? <laughs> I sure did. Uh, and so Jennifer Lewis, who plays the mom on Blackish right, right now, the mom and the grandma, if you watch, if you're familiar with that show on ABC, um, she's done several mother roles. I mean, she's been Whitney Houston's mother, Nia Long's mother in different, uh, different uh, films, motion pictures. And so her memoir is... Jennifer Lewis, the mother of black Hollywood and her, I I love her. I think she's talented as heck as I'll get out. And she wrote this book. The memoir was released, I should say in 2017. I picked it up during the pandemic, the height of it, working from home and wanted to get away from my, you know, emails and so forth. I was like, I need something. So I, I saw, I ordered a book. And I picked it up, and I it was a nonstop read for me. It was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but she opens up and talks about depression. And she talks right. about sexual addiction. She talks about some of the things that her journey and what she's gone through. And she does it in such a open and funny and uh, relatable, conversational way. And it was like, okay. That memoir that I've been writing, it's like, okay, this is the inspiration for me to make sure I do this because it just, it helps. Mm -hmm. Even someone who, you know, I'm somewhat aware of depression and all the things just through my own journey. And I try to to address them, those issues personally. Um, Even with that, she was still an inspiration. It was like, oh my gosh, this is why people who go through things in life and journeys and have, you know, um, ups and downs and triumphs and highs and lows and peaks and valleys, whatever it is, whatever. It, this is why, and it doesn't have to be Jennifer Lewis. You don't have to be an actor, right? You know, a popular actor or actress or whatever to do it, or somebody on TV. We all have a story to tell, and every time, if we do, if we open ourselves up to do it, if we can write it or have someone write it for us, mm-hmm. or do a audio version of it. Um, think about how you help someone so much and you might not think that you would, but right. you do I, so much. Like I, um, I follow Jennifer Lewis on Instagram and I wrote and I said, you know, something about how I wrote her book and, you know, read her book and oh my gosh, the, she actually responded. It was a quick little response, but she actually, you know, responded to my Instagram, right. um, uh, comment about her book. So. You know, I don't know. Now, was there? Um, you mentioned your mom's name quite a quite quite a bit. Mm-hmm. My mom, grandma. How how much of a of a factor was was your mom through your journey? Because she had to help you cope with mm-hmm. an alcoholic father, mm-hmm. um, your sexuality, mm-hmm. your um, your journey to to travel a good path and to make a good life for yourself. Mm-hmm. How much of an impact is she currently into, into your life been, and how mm-hmm. supportive is she and other members with your decision? Because like you said, in our community, mm-hmm. yeah, going to a therapist to acknowledge that yeah, you, you have, have these things, you <laughs> have issues, is taboo. It's so taboo. Um, well, my mom passed away in 2009. Okay, sorry. Um, she had uh, pancreatic cancer. And um, actually, her journey through that um, is connected to my journey actually to coming back home to really? work uh, in that I, I had no intention to come back home to live in Indy. I was working in uh, Pennsylvania and a, a smaller TV market, but it was closer to New York City. And there were other reasons why I wanted to stay on the East Coast um, or in the Northeast. But my mom got sick in 2015 and I found myself coming back and forth mm-hmm. to Indy a lot 
uh, to the point where I was on the verge of taking a leave of absence for my my work to come be with her as she was getting really through the really difficult uh, end time of her pancreatic cancer journey. And lo and behold, I get an email from a TV station in Indianapolis. I had a friend who I worked with in Pennsylvania who said, hey, I know this guy who's a news director at, at uh, Fox station in Indianapolis, and they're looking for a morning reporter, you know, a feature. They want some, like, a, you know, somebody could be a part of the, the cast, not as an anchor, but as the fun person who goes around. Anyway, and he said, should I, can I share your info with him? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So within, I don't know, next day or whatever, I get an email from this news director said hey and then he had already looked at my work and the general manager and so they were like man we want to <laughs> we want to meet you we want to hire we want to hire you and i i was like oh and my contract i was in the near the end of my contract where i was so i would be available and um i was actually going to come home to, to see mom to visit and when i came home that one time in june i think it was that year 2009 um Maybe, yeah, I think it was June. Anyway, um, came home, met with the management at Fox 59, and then next thing you know, I had a job. And then I came home. So I was able to be home with my mom throughout the last four months of her her life when she passed away in November of 2009. And it was all connected. And for her, it, it she was so excited, right? I mean, she's just one of her, I always wanted you to work at home and, you know, be and work in Indy on TV. And I... Kind of, sort of did initially, but then, you know, as I got older and it didn't happen, I was like, yeah, that's okay. I had a couple of times where I interviewed and it didn't happen. Right. And um, this time it did. And it was, it turned out to be this, the best, you know, godsend for both of us. This amazing gift that it, I got a chance to, to be close to my mom in the last four months of her life and get to see how proud she was of me. Mm-hmm. Right, so that part of the journey was amazing, but it was uh, really an up and down journey for us because you know my mom had issues, we had issues with each other, you know. I think you're going through, uh, you know, I would blame her, you know, for not, oh my gosh, dad, and then you know I blamed typical teenager stuff, typical stuff, twenties, thirties, when you think you know it all still. Um, How hard so, was the journey to 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 treatment? Um, because really, if you're if you're if you're pointing fingers, yeah, it had to be a difficult journey. Oh my God, it was awful, Andre. It was really. I mean, I look, and and again, it's a constant journey. And pointing fingers, as you put it, which is a great way to say it, I think, um, was another hurdle for me that I had to stop doing that. You Did know, you I, lose friends along the way because now? You're still in denial. Now you got to come out of denial. So uh, you were know you what? losing I, a lot of friends no, on the way? No, I don't think I did. I think most friends, I mean, my friends, I, I mean, they all knew me. And, you know, so I, and I, I'm not a confrontational person, so I never really, the things that I went through, I really more internalized than I did anything else. Right. Uh, but specifically with, you know, with my mom and, and people like, who my mom was still living, uh, everyone else in my uh, childhood had passed away and my other my her mom my grandmother and um my aunt mary or my grandmother and poppy they had all had long passed away so really my mom it was just us and both of us working through all the things you know that we had to work through and that you know in any uh adult child relationship so did the abandonment so, issues kick in because now you're losing your family so you're going from yeah uh, one one illness yeah. Now it's I triggering so. into another illness because who do you depend on? This but, was your rock. Yeah. But I think my mom actually, before she passed away, we had become so close mm-hmm. that, um, you know, we would often talk about how, how close we were, you know, just, and how crazy that all yeah. happened. All that, happened. Yeah. And, uh, so no, I really didn't, you know, sitting here now, all the things that I've gone through, there's I didn't I don't live through any regrets of that. It was actually, it finally became and made sense to me everything, and so I can sit here and go, wow, 
that part of my life, the issues growing up, all the things, all, you know, my mom and I were able to get so much out and just talk and say <laughs> what we wanted, how we wanted. And um, it probably you, made you feel really good knowing that well, when she passed away, there was maybe a sense of closure. Oh, on both, my gosh. Both of you guys we part. had it. So I'm telling you, Andre, I'm not even kidding. We had such closure. And um, it was so it was just a, a really cool thing. And I remember the night before my mom passed away, I was sitting. She was in a, a nursing facility and, um, you know, they didn't think she was going to make it through that particular day. And, you know, I sat there with her and I knew, you know, she could probably hear me, but that's about it. Right. Um, I went home um, to I was again back here in Indy, but I was living in her apartment at the time until she passed away but um i remember going back to her apartment and sleeping in her bed and just being around all of her belongings and just her her aura and i woke up i don't know gosh like three o'clock in the morning and something just came over me and i i checked my phone no one had called to say anything you know hey your mom has passed away but about 10 20 minutes later i got that call Oh my God! That she had passed away, and I remember having this this dream and saying to my, you know, mom, it's okay, you know, let go, and and sure enough, you know, but um, she did. One of the things that she had said to me before this, it was you know a couple of months before she died, is that you know she's like, I wish I had you deserved a better mother than I was to you. And I remember saying to her, uh, no, <laughs> no. And here we are right now. So whatever doesn't matter because guess what? Here we are together. Yeah. You know, all those things that here we are. So I don't know. Let me ask a question. Um, you talked about your sexuality. That had to be. A journey within itself yeah being in the being gay you mean yeah, yeah i just yeah, yeah. You, you know being being in the going down the path that you that you went oh, to, yeah. to be in the, the media how yeah. did you adjust to that well and i compliment you for acknowledging it at such a young age and able to still move forward like uh they said in a positive frame of mind this is me this is blah 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 yeah i mean i think um you know, being openly gay is has been a struggle, but I I don't know. I I certainly believe that it has definitely hurt my career in some ways, um, especially during the eighties and nineties and being in this being in a, in a newsroom and you know at one point not being on TV because I worked behind the scenes, but then and being on TV <clears throat> definitely. But when you say um, it hurt your career, as to as to what? <coughs> excuse just, me. Just opportunities. And just that, opportunities and and people making, you know, jumping to conclusions. Miseducation, about that, I guess, or just saying that that meaning that that something like that would define you, and and it doesn't. You know, it's one of the, the things that really bugs me about how we label things and people. It's like, I mean, that doesn't define who I am. That has nothing to do with it. You know, um, <clears throat> but yes, definitely. You know, I, I admire people who have reached a certain pinnacle in their career and say, hey, I'm out. And they come out, you know, they, they after making, you know, buku bucks in the media and they, you know, have a show or they're hosting a national show or something. And then all of a sudden, hey, I'm gay. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then people rally around them like, oh, my gosh, thank you for doing this. And thank you. I mean, I think it's fine because all of a sudden now they're an example and they can, you know, other younger people can go, hey, I can be that too. Um, but <clears throat> for me, that journey was different in that I was actually open during my career, moving mm -hmm. up, going to different TV markets for the, and, and it, it made it difficult, you know, it made it really difficult. I mean, there were times when I felt like I, oh my gosh, I have to be in the closet. I'm living in this little town and. <clears throat> excuse me um and there were times when i did have to step back i can't say i would, went back in the closet but i did i didn't tell people you know 
um, because where I was in my career, because where I was living, and because I knew it had <clears throat> had hurt in some way prior to even getting to where I was. So it was a struggle. And even, you know, now here sitting here talking about it at age 60, mm. you know. You don't look 60. Um, <laughs> that I, you know, I... <clears throat> In some ways, to me, it's it's still it's so disappointing that we would even have to <clears throat> have the conversation, you know, because, you know, we all have whatever journeys and things that we go through in our lives that make up who we are. And not, in my opinion, not one thing does that. Right. Um, and for that to be something that someone may judge me on or make an impression on or be the first thing they say, you know, after all these years, I mean, I've you know won a couple of Emmys and done all kinds of things and career while like talking professionally specific so do you feel like sometime <clears throat> um, let me do you feel like sometime you have to um, be the the um, let me rephrase this so it makes sense does sometime you feel like that you have to be the forefront leader um, about your decision about being gay or being black or being yeah. anything yeah i mean i think there's a i think there's a certain <clears throat> expectation sometimes of people and i think I'll, i will kind of really address that you know specifically as being a, a, a black person and being you know working in my hometown um <clears throat> you know I, i've been so blessed and so embraced you know that i there's nothing that I could say or complain about or go, oh, my God. But <clears throat> there is a certain level of expectation that comes with that. And sometimes I'm not quite sure I live up to that. Why do you say that? Because, me, the because, because the demand is high because yeah, you're a public figure? Yeah, I just think that because I don't, I, you know, I don't feel like I alone have the ability to live up to someone's expectations of me when they're these grand thing i just i'm not i mean i'm just a guy who goes and does what he does for a living i mean that might translate to other people as something really powerful and that's fantastic but to me yeah i don't i don't have that power. i don't have well, that you, power you, to your actions so, speak your actions speak for themselves well, so yeah, a lot of times you don't have to do that you that's true you're doing it by what you're doing now i remember one situation andre where there's a lady who came up to me and uh gosh i think it was at the zoo Indianapolis Zoo, and I was doing an event. I had a person walking me through the zoo and kind of giving me, hey, this is what you're going to be doing for the night. You're going to be doing this, you're doing this, and they're walking me through. And we had we were in a very short window to get this done before I needed to be on stage to do what I they had asked me to do. Anyway, and there's a, a little kid and mom and <clears throat> came up to me, this little kid, and he's like, oh, my God you know and, and he made this huge deal of oh my gosh Sherman and I just sort of downplayed it like oh hey you know and, and I guess the mom expected me to kind of go oh hey you know and I didn't and as I was walking away she had a look of disappointment that wait a minute you know my kid looks up to you and you just sort of kind of walked away from him and she it was to the point where she actually emailed me what and and I said you know to her conversation via email I was like she's like you know your son my son looks up to you and you just you know didn't really I don't know I guess I didn't live up to expectation and my response was the first of all I said I'm sorry I didn't really did not and second no I don't feel like I really don't feel like I'm anything to look up to. <laughs> I guess I wasn't raised. I mean, raising being raised to be humble right. puts you in a situation and puts you in a situation. But when you embrace being humble, those things to me are not worthy right. because I'm not. I mean, if that's something what someone sees and that is fantastic, right? right. My actions and they, I, I I love it. But internally, I don't internalize those things because. You know, in our business, the good and the bad, you know, if you if you read your reviews on either side, if they review you and they love you, they review you and they hate you, and if you take them personally either way, then it's not a good thing. Right, right. Right? Right. So I don't. I try to be very neutral about, you know, any kind of compliment. <laughs> I love it. 
and it's fantastic and um that's great but you know i i choose to stay humble tell me that what makes is, sense. tell me yeah yeah tell me what is what is what's it like to to be sherman and and going to all these great places. <laughs> I, I remember w when I watch you on TV, I'd be like, man, I wish he invite me on one of these tours to eat all this fancy food and <laughs> yeah. meet all these people. But w what's, what's it like? It's fun, actually. It really is. I get to do something that it was like a dream come true for me that it kind of evolved, you know. And, um, you know, I get to be a TV personality in my hometown. But gosh, really? <laughs> I mean, I get to do all these great things and I get to profile all these fantastic people and um, it's it's uh, that part of my life is so fun. It's so incredibly blessed. I can't even tell you. Um, I look back. I was I you know I have I had a career you know a little acting career back in the day in the eighties and I was what what kind of I, acting career did you have? What, what kind of acting were you it doing? It was it was nothing bad. Just put it that way. No, it was, it was a little like, Abner. Uh, no, 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 no. I did. Uh, Commercial acting and was studying okay. in L.A. and studied with actually studied with some people who are pretty big names. But um, I remember writing, you know, you, get, you go through some of the visualization classes that you might take in L.A. as an actor. Because a lot of it is just like sticking to it and maybe just kind of projecting and seeing. Yourself. Right. There's so many talented people. I mean, most people don't realize how many. And you kind of go. Anyway, I I wrote how I visualize myself how I visualize myself Sherman Burdett comma TV personality right now I was doing acting classes but that's how I visualize myself as a TV personality not really an actor but so I have in my notes I'm going back and looking at stuff and writing memoir and I realize oh my gosh this is what I wrote and then I like oh my gosh that's what I am <laughs> today <laughs> yeah. so yeah I I love it what it's like being Sherman is kind of weird I think you probably have to ask people who are my friends more than me but um you know, people recognize you and they come up to you. And um, but at the end of the day, where Sherman is really about the person, I'm not me, the person, but who we're profiling that right. day. Right. The restaurant, the small business owner, um, the event that we might be uh, highlighting. You know, those people who we highlight. I mean, I'm really they're 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 putting their trust in me to make them look good on TV right. for that three or four or whatever minutes, and. Which can be so important to them, right? right? I mean, it's so important. And well, you're showcasing I, their business right, and what and, they do for a living. Right, and so I take that you know, very seriously in a fun way. Right. And I always tell people, look, we, we're here to make you look good. We're not going to make you look bad. We're gonna, it's all about you. Have you ever made somebody, at least let me rephrase that, has a... <laughs> Have has, I ever made anybody look bad? And, <laughs> I hope has not, anybody Andre. ever said, you know, <laughs> naturally, has anybody ever said, wow, you know, this is what I, what I thought it would be? Because you're always going to have that one or two yeah. strong people just like you get bad reviews and good reviews. Yeah, I mean, usually it's always positive. There's some people who, you know, we have on who maybe have not seen, you know, where Sherman, are not really familiar and don't watch and they have to. It's, you know, us being there or my being there and me and my photographers is an introduction to. Um, and I deal with a lot of people who ha are not, you know, they're, they're not used to being on TV. Oh, okay. So there's that element of trying to relax them and trying to put them at ease uh, that it's going to be okay. And even some people who rush to email me and say, I want to be on. And then once you go, oh, okay. And then they're, they're just a bag of nerves, <laughs> you know? And so you have to, so I really have to research. I have to know their business as much as I can. I have to know who they are, what they do enough that should that happen? And it happens a you lot. Can should they over. crumble? Yeah. Uh, I take over and kind of become their megaphone. Yeah. Um, I hate those situations to be honest. I really do. Uh, but it they, it they happen probably about 50% of the time. You'd be amazed at how many people get so nervous on being on TV. But I love it. You, love it. You, you're, you're, you've been in the business for, for quite some time. Definitely made uh, a lot of friends. In the, in the media, who are some of the role models? I already mm -hmm. know Tina Cosby's one. Psh, we already know that. Mm -hmm. But name me, name me some other influ, influ, influential people. people. Yeah. Um, well, Tina Cosby, <laughs> Wish TV, <laughs> formerly Wish TV, uh, uh, now doing her thing on the radio um, at the light. Uh, and Patty Spitler, whom both have been on the show with you. Um, and I, I, I worked with both of them when I was um, 
right out of college at Ball State, I I was a videotape editor, you know, a wannabe TV reporter. Did they see talent in you to go to the next level? I don't know. I think Tina probably more than anybody, but I don't really know. I know I I don't think anybody really did. I I don't. I mean, I looked like a I looked like Urkel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was wearing braces still, and uh, I, I, I have a tendency to look like ten or plus years younger than I actually am. Okay. I have always looked like a, you know, <laughs> which wasn't a good thing at the time. I kind of embrace it now, but um, don't let us pull up some old <laughs> foot video footage. Well, I know, right? <laughs> uh, but um, you know, no, I mean, it was a struggle back then to try to me try to get on and try to be on TV. But one of my influences, uh, a national influence, if you will, I, re- I remember watching. Uh, Bryant Gumbel, who uh, was the first black American male to co- co-host or host a, a network morning show on NBC, the Today Show. And I remember seeing him and going, oh, my gosh, I can do that. And I was, I think, a sophomore in, at Ball State at the time, 1980. Isn't it um, funny? We get role models at different ages of our mm-hmm. life. Yeah. yeah, and and I, you know, I, the, I it always stands out to me. I, I've never met Brian Gumble. I never worked at NBC. I worked in NBC affiliates, but I never worked for the network. But right. um, he was just the fact that he was there mm-hmm. doing it, and so I remember like wanting to emulate him and be. Oh my gosh, that's who I. You know, I want to be that guy. That's who I want to be. <laughs> I want to be Brian Gumbel. <laughs> you know, this is today on NBC. NBC. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so he was huge influence. Not obviously not someone who I, I met, but he was he was huge. And um, that was probably he was probably the at the time the driving force for me to say I want to do this. And of course, several other local um, local news people. But that was. He was definitely number one in my book. It's like, and I never quite got to a network level. And I would later, which was a, de, you know, that was a source of depression for me because I really, I, come on. But looking back, I realized that that really wasn't where I should be anyway. That I'm actually where I need should be right now. Um, and are you happy where you work, are now? You know, working for a network would not be my. Are you happy where you are? Yeah, at? absolutely. I mean. You know, I, 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 there are other things I'd like to do now that I'm, uh, you know, at this stage of my life. Like what, Broadway acting? Uh, uh, no. Making no, a movie? No, no, no. Making a movie? Well, I do do some movies on the side. I do short films, you know, just for movie uh, fun projects that I work on with, <laughs> okay. with friends. But, um, you know, I guess really where I, I kind of would like to be now would be kind of just, you know, Still doing uh, Where's Sherman, but kind of having my own little gig, you know, having a little podcast or something, having, you know, kind of utilizing and putting together some of the things that I've gathered over the years, putting in this kind of form, kind of like what you're doing, but just doing it um, on my own. And, you know, but that's uh, hopefully if I live long enough, maybe that's something that that's, you, you know, be a little long enough. I, maybe you're that's a, a couple of years <laughs> down down the road. Well, you know, we. We don't have a, we don't have control over how how long we are here or not. So, but you know, hopefully, you know, I get a chance to do that. Uh, but I am happy with what I get to do. Um, I feel blessed. I try to you know show that every morning. And the yeah. irony in that is, I am not a morning person. Really, I hate getting up in the morning. <laughs> oh, do I hate it? <laughs> I, mean, I tell people that all the time. It's like, yeah, really, you're not. I'm like, dude, uh-uh, I'm a night owl. I'm the reverse. <laughs> I grew up a night owl. Okay, you know, you stay up till two, three, and get up at eight. Really? Then you go or whatever. Is but, uh, yeah, no, I'm. I and I still, um, when I my alarm typically goes off at, you know, four o'clock in the morning or. During this pandemic, when I was working at home mostly and doing, I had to do a little makeshift studio in our garage. How did you? How did you? Um, how did you proceed moving forward with with the pandemic? Because everybody had to mm-hmm. reinvent themselves, so to speak. Yeah, and I say that um, you know we're still we're still living it, so who knows? But um, I had to actually put together, you know, a st- little makeshift studio at home. Mm-hmm. Um, my all my segments, you know, it's where I am. So we were actually on location. I mean, that's the whole foundation of 
what we do or what I do. So, um, but, and all of a sudden you couldn't, right? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? So, you know, I talked to my uh, partner, Bill, at home. I'm like, you know what? I got to. He's like, well, whatever you got to do. How supportive is your so, partner? We didn't talk about him. How su- I how don't want to talk about me. him. He'd be like, do not talk about me. <laughs> do not me, talk about me. <laughs> okay? Just because you want to talk about you, do not talk about me. Uh, but uh, he's fine. He's awesome. But I, I – um, so I said, you know, this, so I put together a little side part of our, you know, uh, garage and right. turned it into a backdrop. He was like, well, we can't do it in the house at whatever in the morning because it defeats the whole purpose of having somebody come into your house right which would be my photographer and i'm like yeah that's not going to work and we have animals who would be barking and like which is not it just so now not. you really got to think now <laughs> right and so I'm like oh my gosh we're gonna so i have a collection of things uh i have my little office space at home and i have a collection of things that people have given me throughout the years of being where sherman you like little you know things that they make or a, a picture or like the i don't know a, a caricature or all these things that people would make uh and so i started piecing them together into a corner uh, a corner space in our garage and i purchased some lights um on Amazon, <laughs> and I was like, I, there it was, and right. it just sort of evolved. And so I had to do everything from home. And what we would do is, if a person, let's say, if we were highlighting, um, um, a lot of time we had a, a lot of uh, do-it-yourself places where you come in and make a frame or you make a poster or whatever. We highlight highlight a lot of those during that time. They would bring things to me. Mm-hmm. I tell them what I needed. I'd set it up in my garage. I'd show off what they did. We'd do a link to their website. And that's kind of how we, we did most of them. Um, we had some fundraiser things where people would say, hey, well, I'm going to, if you know, meals. You could do, well, bring me the food. You know, I, I'll set it up. I remember there were times when I had, I'm at 3 o'clock in the morning at home setting up food that somebody had dropped <laughs> off. Yeah. And plating it and displaying it, you know, so I could put it on TV at, at a certain time in the morning. So those were adjustments. Um, and we all went through adjustments, right? Right, right. And I think we're all still in the residue of those adjustments and wondering what's next. What are we going to have to that do? That is the big question. What is right? next? I mean, I don't anticipate a you know complete shutdown, or you know, we never really were in a complete shutdown. But you know, I don't anticipate. You know, who knows? Maybe we'll have to. But um, it for us in TV, you know, TV goes on. You know, right. that's what people look. We're still going to be doing a newscast, so I still had to figure it out. And I would never, never forget when my producers, executive producers, said, "Well, Sherman, you know, if you're not going to work, that means they're going to have to take you. You know, if you're not going to be here, that means they're going to take your vacation days." I'm like, uh, uh-uh. uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. You mean not, if I'm going to be all, you got to go take because I don't have. Y'all gonna take my vacation days? Now you're really gonna figure out what to Shoot, do. Shoot, I better figure out something. <laughs> Before we wrap up, yeah, I know. Am I taking up too much no, time? No, I don't no, even no, know. You're, you're fine. Okay. Before we wrap up, um, how do people get in contact with you that may have something mm-hmm. to talk about on? Yeah, if you have your a place, show. If you, you know, I, I'm glad you asked that because there is uh, sometimes people would okay. think well you're only on the north side or you're only on the carmel or you're only um number one we try to go everywhere it doesn't matter what side of town east side west side south side we really genuinely do um we also have to make sure that the place or that we're focusing on is worthy of being on tv i mean um you know there's a criteria has got a criteria that you know we got to make sure this this and this and this and there's a list of things that people need to do in order to be on TV with us that I send out to them. It's like, this is, if it's a business, you know, I explain, Hey, we need this much food. We need this. We need, so I have to explain to every person, every guest, this is what we need for TV. So is there a website or, or so email to, link they need to go to? Um, yeah. Well, my email S B U R D E T T E at Fox 59.com. Jason, do we have any of that information we can put up on the backboard? We can get it to him. And then it's S B U R D E T T E at f o x five nine dot com. You reach out to me via email or uh, inbox me at Facebook because you can find me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter at Sherman Burdett right there. 
because you clearly have some say so in 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 the guests and the topics that go onto your show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm the producer. I'm the producer. I'm the planner. I'm the writer. Talent. The only thing I don't do is shoot it, and that's BJ, my photographer, who does that. Who's an excellent. He is excellent at field producing and helping, and we both together try to make our guests uh, as comfortable as possible on location. <laughs> Which is what you've I, done to I, me today. Well, you know, I, I really wanted to, because like I said, <laughs> when we talked on the phone, when I'm interviewing people, you know, I can kind of get a feel on where they're, where they're going. And, and I want them to feel comfortable, because you said it plain and simple. Everybody that's been on this show has a story to tell. I don't want nobody telling my story but me. Mm-hmm. It's great that you tell it, because when, when somebody else tells it, it's going to be interpreted 50 different ways, and I always like to hear it. Mm-hmm. But nobody can tell your story better than you. We just had a beautiful election. We had the first African American vice president. African American Indian descent. Yeah, yeah. all oh. of it. We changed it. We changed the format of of how we look at the political race now. Um, with that said. Give me your viewpoint on where you see the world going and what you oh, would like gosh. to see the world going. <laughs> yeah, I'm so not worthy to answer that. But I will say this. Um, you know, I, I, you know, working in TV news, and as much as people might think that there's a side taken on, on a newscast or whatever, there's certain cable outlets that take sides and political sides, and that's what they do. That's how they make their, their money. Um, personally, apolitical is where I sit. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, to see someone like uh, Kamala Harris achieve what she's achieved recently, um, to me, any politics set aside, is uh, it's just a beautiful thing to say, you know what, you don't have to look a certain way or be a certain gender to be a head of state in America. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, to to sit in an Oval Office or to sit at the second highest office of the land or, you know, anytime someone makes a groundbreaking, uh, in my opinion, um, a statement like that or reaches that pinnacle, it's it. I think it benefits us all. Right. Right. It doesn't even matter if you you know, I'm not of Asian, Indian or Asian descent, but it doesn't matter because seeing the fact, you know, seeing her be of half of that descent and to be able to do what she's done right. is fantastic. And it just says, you know, you don't have to be this box, you know, to check in order to get to a certain place. And I just think, I hope, and I, you know, I mean, we've had that past with, you know, with President Obama as well. I mean, I just hope it really opens up, you know, to others to say, look, we, we need to put down all the racial barriers and all the, the, the gender barriers and all those barriers. If someone's gay or straight or this or that, I mean, look how look at how much we can open up our world when we don't look in a specific box for a certain thing. Mm-hmm. There's so many things, you know, coloring outside the lines, right? Right. I mean, there's so many things outside the lines of which we have grown to think that we how our leaders should look or be. They don't have to be. Right. And so I just hope that we see more of that. And I hope um, that regardless of politics, that people see it as a positive and not a negative. With that said, mm-hmm. I'd like to thank Sherman Burnett for being on the show. Mm. Please check him out on Where Sherman, because today he's with the Andre the Beast show, <laughs> and he's definitely has opened up himself, not for sympathy, but to show that when you recognize that you have an illness or anything emotionally wrong with you, um, you need to you need to recognize it and you need to to seek help and get it taken care of. You need to also realize that um, change happens when we put one foot in front of the other. Um, check him out on Fox mm-hmm. 59. He's a, he's definitely a leader. I have the greatest respect for him. Um, um, 
I, I can't even say a whole bunch more than that. I have a great okay. deal of respect for you, especially the fact that you came here and was willing to feel comfortable because I like the fact that you was comfortable and able to share that uh, message to the, the, the viewers. With that said, thank you for tuning in to an episode of the Andre the Beast Show.